Our keynote speaker for this afternoon is a native of Brookhaven, Mississippi, was elected to the state senate in 1999, serving Lawrence, Lincoln, and Simpson counties in District 39. She has been a champion for farmers and ranchers of Mississippi throughout her entire career. She, was, uh, she has authored countless pieces of legislation that have set policy and regulations benefiting agriculture in this state. She is well known throughout the state for her passionate defense of private property rights and for promoting and protecting all facets of agriculture. She is a strong supporter of the right to farm. She turned down other legislative appointments to remain as a chair of the Agriculture Committee because that is where her passion is. She and her husband, Mike, are parents of Anna Michael, the family's fifth generation farmer. They raise beef cattle and are partners in the Livestock County Livestock Auction, a local auction which is held in Brookhaven every Tuesday since 1942. Her legislative experience coupled with her background in agriculture made her the logical choice for the state's next commissioner of agriculture. Please help me welcome Senator, I mean Commissioner-elect, Ms. Cindy Hyde-Smith. <laughs> Thank you so much and Randy and I, and I truly appreciate the opportunity that I can come today and address this crowd. I am just truly honored to be in your presence. And uh, you know, when I look out across these members, the Farm Bureau, uh, I'm looking down at some notes that I was thinking about last night. Normally I don't write a speech, I just get up and wing it. And my husband said, boy, she wrote some notes down. This must be important, and it is important. I owe you so much gratitude for supporting me throughout the years in my Senate initiatives and then now as I go into um, serving the office of the Commissioner of Agriculture and Commerce of this great state. But you know a wise man once said that there are three kinds of people in all types of organizations. The rowboat people, the sailboat people, and the steamboat people. Rowboat people need to be pushed or shoved along. Sailboat people move when a favorable wind is blowing. Steamboat people move continuously through calm or storm. They usually are masters of themselves, their surroundings, and their fate. Farmers are no doubt steamboat people. To me, you are all of that, but mainly just my kind of people. Those who work hard, play hard, pray hard, and truly appreciate the small things in life. Yesterday, I watched and listened as my 79-year-old daddy and my child put up a Christmas tree. Anna Michael made a pot of coffee, and Daddy just bragged and bragged on it, but, uh, and it was good. But it could have been liquid dynamite, and the comments would have been the same. You know, days like that are true treasures, memories that can bring a smile for years to come. Today is a true treasure. Today is the first opportunity that so many of us have had a chance to get together and share and celebrate the overwhelming passage of Initiative 31, the eminent domain referendum. And I assure you, it will bring a smile to my face for many years. This historical stride that was made is so significant. This was the first time in Mississippi history that a constitutional amendment has actually been passed at the ballot box. There have been 37 initiatives filed with the Secretary of State's office. Prior to this year, only two have made it to the ballot and both of them failed. The required number of signatures for this referendum was 12% of the total number of votes cast for the governor in the last gubernatorial election, which was 89,285. Farm Bureau collected well over 600,000 signatures. Folks, that is phenomenon. Over 70% of the voters casting ballots on this initiative favored stronger private property rights. Ronald Reagan, in his farewell address to the nation, said, as long as we remember our first principles and believe in ourselves, the future will always be ours. He then added, and something else we learned, once you begin a great movement, there's no telling where it will end. Friends, we have began a great movement. The ag vote has brought respect to a whole new level. 
It has totally amazed me the significant notch that has been carved into the measuring stick of politics. Everyone in this state has stood up and taken notice of how stout the Farm Bureau influence is. When we bond together, our strength is mighty. They say in the hand that rocks the cradle rules the world, I assure you, the hands on the wheels of the pickup trucks in Mississippi rocked our opponent's world on November the 8th. I want to thank everyone in this room for their help in that eminent domain battle. During election years, you always hear about different groups of votes, different categories. The black vote, the white vote, the Baptist vote, the Pentecostal vote, the teacher vote, the female vote. Well, I want you to know now the ag vote has been categorized. I heard one fellow say it used to be whoever could carry Rankin County would win. Now, he said, we've made our mark with this. Whoever can carry the ag vote has a 70% head start. It is significant, and it was so much talk on the campaign trail throughout the summer, and especially when it was over of, wow, the ag vote is where you want to spend your time because those people are the 100% crowd. They all vote, and they all care. Thank goodness we are experiencing some good times right now in the ag world. Record high prices for crops and livestock will lift the U.S. farm incomes 19% this year, which for the first time will top $100 billion. You know, the rising demand of food around the world, tight supplies, and favorable exchange rates have boosted U.S. commodity prices and attracted investors both in the futures market and in farmland. Throughout my political career, I have been so blessed to work with those farmers that make those things happen, who love making a living on the land and wouldn't trade their profession no matter how hard, dirty, and cold it is for any other profession. No doubt one of my greatest blessings is to be able to raise my child on a farm. You know, my mother would always plant a pea patch every year, and she would always make the comment, I'm, just not, I'm not just raising peas, I'm also raising children and they need to know how to work. This past summer was no doubt the hardest campaign I've ever been involved in. 82 counties to cover is an awesome task. Even if you are considering gastric bypass surgery, I just suggest that you run for statewide office and you will lose 100 pounds. I personally lost 23, and uh, I've gained most of it back, and uh, things are going really good now. But you know, one thing that you learn when you are covering the state is that we truly live in a beautiful state. Not only beautiful scenic pathways when you go down the highway, but also people. Up at Vardaman, when I spent time with the sweet potato folks, you know, driving away, I thought, this truly is God's country in our state. Everywhere we went in this state, at one point or another, Farm Bureau was a topic of conversation. I went into the Farm Bureau office in Calhoun City, and I must admit it was my first visit to Calhoun City. I walked in and the Farm Bureau agent said, boy, you are really working hard. You were just in here last week. And boy, I was taking credit for that hard work and his secretary said, no, that was Lynn Fitch. <laughs> I got in the car and I texted her and I said, I hope you're getting as, me as many votes as I'm getting you. But there were so many stories on the campaign trail and one of them were down in Goche, Mississippi on the Gulf Coast. Katie Barker drove for me, and she was this cute little 22-year-old, and we were speaking to the Goche Men's Club. And we walked in, got there a little early, <clears throat> and I promise this is a true story. During, uh, when we got in there, this man looked at us and he said, are you the pole dancers? And I thought, <laughs> no. I said, I am running for commissioner of agriculture, and Katie Barker is my driver. Guys, when we got back there to the back, there really was a pole. <laughs> And uh, I told him that uh, I was the commissioner, but uh, when I saw that, I, I, I took Goche real big, but that's all we're going to say about that. And one of the uh, things when I was in a group of crusty gentlemen that uh, probably didn't think a woman needed to be running for agriculture, and I picked up on that by the jokes they were telling. And the first one was, if your wife is knocking on the front door and the dog is barking at the back door, which one do you let in first? He said, the dog, of course, it quits barking when it gets inside. <laughs> and then he followed that up 
with the, uh, he said, did you hear about the bank robber whose mask fell down while he was robbing the bank? And uh, I said, no, and he said, well, he got to the first guy and he had his gun out, he was robbing the bank, and he looked at him and he said, did you see my face when the mask fell down? He said, I did. Bow, he shot him in the head and killed him. He got to the next man, he said, did you see my face when the mask fell down? He said, no, but I believe my wife did. <laughs> So I knew then <laughs> that uh, there were some folks out there that may not quite be ready for a woman yet. But it did turn out well. We had so many experiences during the campaign. And I guess one of the most significant ones that uh, happened was several weeks ago, I was leaving Tupelo one night. And we were in a small airplane. And I was going to get to be home and fly back to Brookhaven. And I called Mike and Anna Michael. And I said, I'm leaving Tupelo. We're headed back to Brookhaven. You know, go on to bed, and I'll come on in. Well, we took off. And I noticed there was static in the radio that I had not noticed earlier during the day. And uh, you know, I, just, I could hear that. And we got up about Kosciuszko. And I could tell the pen lights on the plane were getting really dim. And I looked out on my wingspan, and there was a light out there that was getting really dim. And so I finally looked at the pilot and I said, you know, I don't know a whole lot, but the alternator's going out on this airplane. <laughs> and he said, you know, I've been sitting here trying to figure out how I was going to tell you that. I said, well, since we both know, what are we gonna do about it? He said, we've gotta get it down. He said, we've gotta get the aircraft down. Well, this is at night. Luckily, it was a full moon. And uh, my thought was, you know, let's turn and head to Startville. I think, uh, you know, we might could do that. And he said, no, we're going to head into Jackson. It got, the lights went out in the airplane and I used my cell phone to put next to the panel so we could see the high, how high above the trees we were by looking at the panel to see how, what our altitude was. That's, you know, we were at a safe level above the trees. And the lights went dark. And I did not know this, and I think everybody in the world knew it but me, but at 10 o'clock, the, most of the airports turn off their runway lights. So we knew if we didn't get there by 10, we could not land. And had about 20 minutes probably left on the engine. So plan B was to put it down in the Ross Barnett Reservoir. The pilot said, you know, we can slow down enough, or we could have slowed down enough to, uh, we could jump out and have a survivable crash. And, you know, I was thinking about this, and I looked and I said, well, I'm not jumping out without my purse. <laughs> but we got to the end of the runway at 9.59, and we touched down, the lights went out. So uh, that was a, a pretty uh, harrowing experience to come through, and I called my husband, and I said, we didn't make it quite back to Brookhaven, but we did make it to Jackson, and uh, you're going to have to come get me. And I think he went and bought some more Farm Bureau life insurance on me after that, too. So you did benefit from that. But, uh, you know, it's just such a great time of the year, the Christmas season, that we can come here and have this convention and enjoy each other's company. And I think of a song that uh, I think Anna Michael told me, Kenny Chesney sings it, and it's The Boys of Fall. And it talks about, you know, that kickoff on Friday night and facing the flag and the stars and stripes and the national anthem and the butterflies and the stomachs before they can actually kick off for the game. And one of the lines in it says, you know, you've messed with one man, you've got us all. And that's what I think about now of this group and the ag group. We are such a cohesive bond and it's such a bond that uh, is hard to describe. But I feel like that song, you mess with one and you've got us all. Thank you for the opportunity to be here, and I truly wish your family a very Merry Christmas. In my new role, I will be down on Jefferson Street at the Coliseum, or across the street from the Coliseum at the Department of Agriculture, and uh, I just encourage you to stop in and say hello, to uh, keep that close contact going, and uh, I just look forward to so many things. We have the momentum going. We have the significant ag vote there that people do pay attention. We need to capitalize on that. And I just look for great things. And I look for your leadership, uh, look for your ideas. But most of all, I'm asking for your prayers to just support me through prayer in this new endeavor. And thank you so much for having me and Merry Christmas. <laughs>